Hi. Uh, today, we are looking at a lesson titled, God Forgives the Penitent. And this is an example of David who um, <clears throat> found himself in um, grievous sin, a um, situation that he uh, brought upon himself. And <clears throat> he writes this psalm, Psalm 51, which is an expression of his heart, in which he's asking for forgiveness from the Lord, and he's expressing the conditions that he's undergoing as a result of the sin that he's committed. So we want to pick it up Psalms 51, and we're going to read verses 1 to 13. Psalms 51, verses 1 to 13. Says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, <clears throat> according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. So he's giving an understanding indication of the grievous state that he's in. He is suffering tremendously from the repercussions of the sin that he committed, and his spirit. Basically, his soul is in agony, and he's crying out to the Lord for forgiveness. The only source in which he can turn to receive what he really needs, that is uh, absolution, absol absolution from what has taken place, restoration, and an ability to continue to serve God. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. When a, a, a habit of sin takes place in a life, there's only one of two ways that a person can go with that. Either they can go to the Lord, or they can continue in the conditions which will continue to build up as a result of the sin. And the scripture tells us, the transgression, sin, brings upon the life a curse. And a curse leads to a judgment unless it's dealt with. David realizes this. David, after he's been confronted by the prophet Nathan, turns to the Lord with all his heart. Verse 4, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Speaking here about the condition of the whole human race. Everybody is born in a condition, a sin state. It is a propensity to sin. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with Esau, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out my, all mine iniquity. Create me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So he's thinking about Saul, who he witnessed the result of transgressions against God. Saul basically had the Holy Spirit depart from him and for the rest of his life was under the influence of a demon spirit that ultimately took control totally of all his faculties. It destroyed him. <clears throat> Verse 12, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. So a person who has gone through a situation like this and repented has a tremendous testimony about what God can do in our life. Now what we want to take from these passages of Scripture are principles dealing with sin, what it is, and how it affects people. The first principle we come across is that sin is a spirit that lures people to destruction. Every influence that we come across in life can be traced to a spirit. <clears throat> the creation is spiritual. 
The creation is under the influence of unfallen and fallen spirits. We want to take a look at what the scripture has to say about this sin spirit. Turn to Genesis, the fourth chapter, and we see where initially comes into influencing man. Genesis, the fourth chapter, we want verses three to seven. Here we have the situation of, of Cain and Abel. Genesis 4, I'm going to pick it up in verse 3, read down to verse 7. In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and of his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Cain was an individual who was um, a <clears throat> poster child for uh, a tyrant, an egomaniac, a person who was heartless and uh, only had um, himself in... Um, <clears throat> sense of importance. Cain lived for himself, had no respect for anybody else, and as a result he lived a life that was rejected by God. That's why his offering, sacrifice was rejected. And we pick up verse 6 and 7, what the Lord is saying to Cain. The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. In other words, if you live in such a way that <clears throat> the life you live is centered in <clears throat> the principles that I have laid out for good living, in other words, God's way, God's will, then your offering and you both will be accepted. And he goes on, if thou doest not well, in other words, if you're not living a life that's acceptable to me, sin lies at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now what does this mean? Sin, he's talking about an individual, a sentient being, an intelligence. He's saying sin is entered into the world, the sin spirit is entered into the world, and it's looking for targets of opportunity. If you do not live well, if you do not live according to the harmony of life that I have designed life to be lived, sin is going to pick you out and he's going to endeavor to enter into your life so that he might impart his will, his design, his desires upon you. In other words, sin is a parasite spirit that looks for dwellings in which it can cohabit. And he says, <clears throat> If thou doest well, thou shalt thou be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lies at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire. In other words, his desire is to impart his desire into your life, to totally dominate your life by his will, his desire. And thou shalt rule over him. In other words, he's saying you'll spend the rest of your life trying to maintain control over your life rather than yield to his desire, his, his design for your life. Of course, Cain didn't listen and as, as a result became a murderer, first murderer. First man out of the human race to be born was a murderer. And as a result, he became the first one to be the habitation of the sin spirit. <clears throat> now, Scripture gives us the understanding of uh, this situation. Turn to Romans, the 8th chapter. Scripture teaches the sin spirit lured the whole human race to commit acts of sin, transgression. Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 12 to 14. Romans Excuse me. Romans, Romans 5. Romans 5? 12 to 14. Romans 5, 12 to 14. Yeah. Okay. I might have been thinking about Romans 8. <laughs> <laughs> In this case, it's Romans 5. Romans 8 is pretty, pretty forceful. Oh, yeah. It's pretty strong. 
Yes, indeed. Well, we're going here to Romans 5, starting in verse 12. <clears throat> Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so the death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now we want to take a look at what the scripture is saying. Adam opened the door by transgressing, allowing the sin spirit to enter into the world. Before this, the world was in paradise. Basically, sin was kept outside. Did not have anything to do with the human race. Sin was brought into existence through Lucifer's fall. <coughs> but then... Uh, <coughs> After the fall of Lucifer, the world was cleansed, and uh, that was kept outside. The human race brought forth, and given custodianship, the training in which ultimately it would have dominated the whole world. Madam didn't give the Lord a chance to bring about the plan that he had for the human race, because he wound up sinning. <clears throat> and as a result of sin, he opened the door to all the spirits that had been in vogue before to come back into the world to influence and affect the life of men and animals on the earth. So the scripture tells us because of his transgression, sin spirit had access back into the world. <clears throat> Notice what it goes on to say. Adam. Because of Adam's transgression. For until the law... Sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. In other words, there's a law called the law of sin and death. But if it's not transgressed, it remains neutral. When it's transgressed, you commit an act of sin. The law of sin and death makes demands of payment. In other words, if you sin, the law demands that you make a restoration for that sin. David writes about that in the book of Psalms. <clears throat> he wants to make restitution for the sin, the transgression that he committed. And he's in agony until the Lord makes it possible for this to take place. So if we go on to verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even after them, over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that is to come. What is he saying here? Saying that people were born on the earth and they began to sin not the same sin that Adam committed, but they began to sin as a result of the influence of the sin spirit that was in the world. It caused Cain to murder his brother, and then all that were born on the earth began to come under the influence of the sin spirit. Everybody committed an act of transgression. The scripture says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Ultimately, the whole human race came under a judgment. Everybody, the scripture tells us, has transgressed. <clears throat> it didn't have to be that way. If men had lived in harmony with God after the fall, men would not have had judgment come on them. But each individual sinned. And as a result of that, judgment came on the whole human race. Now, <clears throat> Scripture teaches, the sin spirit became a generation curse. In other words, when everybody sinned, sin took up residence in that individual, and it was passed on to their descendants. Scripture teaches the sin spirit became a generation curse, taking up resident, residence in every generation born on the earth. <clears throat> David speaks about it. He says, in, in iniquity was I conceived. Turn to James, the book of James, fourth chapter, verses four to five. Right after the book of Hebrews, you come to James. When you get to James, we want the fourth chapter. The human race is oblivious of, of its situation. It's under a death sentence. It doesn't know it. Because the eyes are blinded. Yes. 
because the Luciferians, Satan, uses his influence to blind man to the true condition. Only when you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ can you see the true state that you were in before. That that thing does that come. Also, there's something that doesn't come. You're not born in sin. You're, not born in sin. you're born with the propensity to sin. Right. Everybody's born with the sin spirit. First act that a person creates brings judgment on them. Say that again. The first act that a person creates of transgression brings upon them judgment. Now, there is a thing called the <clears throat> age of awareness, where babies are not aware of sin, of transgression, but they reach an age where they understand the difference between good and bad, right and wrong. And when they reach that age and they begin to commit acts knowingly, they bring sin. Yes. Christian girls are not raised in a good Christian home. That has a lot of people building a good foundation for their kids. I think a lot of them can go and join gangs or murders. That's why a lot of them are the way they are because they have no love and under divorced family. I hear that all the time. And you said, you think that one leaves and then, then when this one's a kid, they abandon the kid. It happens all the time. And then I do it all the time. It's so depressing. And that's not healthy for well, a kid. It's They're, because of the parents. The that's sin what I'm is transgressing the father to the son of the fourth generation of them that hate the Lord. Parents is, is held responsible for training his child in the ways of the Lord. And whether he does that, you know, he brings upon himself greater judgment. The sin is on he who knows. Now in James, the fourth chapter, verses four to five, we read, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit, the spirit, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. He's talking about the indwelling sin, parasitical sin spirit that indwells every single individual. Because of the history of the human race, man brought this upon himself. And because he willingly embraces Luciferian influence, it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper in mired in sin, in the things that are going to bring upon the whole human race one day judgment. The antidote for this, of course, is establishing relationship with Jesus Christ, repenting of the sin that we all are guilty of committing, and having our life turned around. Now, God has initiated a master plan to bring this into, into effect. I'm going to take a look at that. But before we do, turn to Romans, the seventh chapter. Here you have an explanation of the struggle, the struggle that Christians have with the sin nature once they get saved. Romans, the seventh chapter, verses 14 to 20. Romans 7, 14 to 20. Here he's talking about the spiritual law of sin and death that regulates all life. It's triggered when we transgress, when we do an act of sin, the law makes a demand upon our life for restoration. And if the restoration is not forthcoming, Curses come upon the life, and if it's still not forthcoming, judgment. Verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, soul under sin. For that which I do I allow not, for what I would that do I not, what I hate that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. The sin spirit in everybody wants its own way, wants its own will for the life. It wants to impart its desire. As the Lord told Cain, it's going to seek to impart its desire in you. You're going to spend your life trying to control 
the desires of the sin nature that's taken up residence in you. Every human being on the face of the earth deals with this, including Christian. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. But to will is present with me. In other words, the desire to do good is present. But how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in the law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. <clears throat> what we find in Christians, if you've experienced the new birth, if you have experienced the new birth in Christ, you have what is called dual nature. If you have not experienced the new birth, then you are basically under the carnal sin nature. And the only recourse that you have is to have a life of morality where you live by certain principles of goodness. But that's as far as an unsaved person can go. But a person who has experienced a new birth has dual nature. You have a sin state, a sin nature, and you have the nature of Christ. Now what Paul is experiencing here is a period of growth where he's struggling with the two natures. Which nature is going to dominate his life? He wants to do good. Every Christian that experiences a new birth experiences this. They want to do good. But they have lived a life dominated by sin until the point that they have reached where they experience a new birth. Then they have a choice. Do you decide sovereignly in your mind that you are going to do the will of God and not the desires of your own nature. When you make that decision, then you are on the road to having the Spirit dominate your life. If you do not come to that decision, then you are going to spend the rest of your life fighting between the two natures. That's why Christians struggle. That's why Christians feel guilty if they do something wrong. Well, I shouldn't have done that. And then condemnation comes upon them. And then they feel that they're not saved anymore. They don't realize that they have to reach a stage of growth where the spirit nature dominates the sin nature and then they go on to grow to maturity. Turn to Philippians, third chapter. Philippians, what? Philippians, the third chapter. Excuse me, Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse 13. <laughs> Philippians, fourth chapter, verse 13. Paul reaches a stage where he's totally dominated by the Spirit. I understand Paul's writing this from a jail cell, solitary confinement. But Paul is as free as he has ever been in his life of sin and struggling. Notice what he says in verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So he's reached that point where the sin state, the sin nature no longer dominates. If you compare this, Romans the fifth chapter, what we just read, He's struggling. What I want to do, the good that I want to do, I can't because it's thwarted by this desire that I have in me to sin. Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse 13, Paul has reached a stage of total maturity over the sin state, and he's walking in victory over every single thing. Matter of fact, he's so free that people are coming to him for advice on how they can get free, and he's in a jail cell. So the scripture is letting us know that when you become dominated by the Spirit, after you have struggled and overcome your own sin nature, and you're well on the way to living totally free, totally open to the fullness of what God has waiting for you in the state of maturity. But let's go on. 
In Christ, when you've experienced the new birth, you become what is called a new creation. Turn to 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 17. <coughs> Second Corinthians, 5th chapter. Here we're looking at what I call the master plan of God. We said that the whole human race is under a death sentence because of the sin state that, it, that it's in, because of its transgression. <clears throat> that has not changed. What has changed is God's master plan. And what he has done is to bring from the human race a creature that is free from the death sentence that hangs on the human race. Scripture teaches, although the human race is under a death sentence, God creates by the new birth within the person a new being which is free from the sin spirit in the death sentence. 2 Corinthians 5th chapter, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. All things, the death sentence, sin spirit, sin nature, are passed away. Behold, all things are become New. We have to understand that, believe it, and act on it for it to make any difference in your life. But well, most people are ignorant of that. They identify with the old nature, the old ways, and they think that now that they become a Christian, then basically everything is going to shape up and they're going to continue on and live life the way that they wanted to live it or the way they think it should be lived. That's not the case. The case is everything that you knew before, everything you were before, is passed away. Everything that you are now is totally N-E-W, new. Just imagine that old habit dead. Exactly. It has no effect on you. Where the person has to believe that. The battle is in here. Exactly. And it's in here. Here only comes from here. Because here is where the new nature is. Right. And as you act on the new nature, here becomes change. So there's a battle between here and here? Right. The individual has right. to understand this condition, what he is in Christ. People are thinking that they're continuing what they were doing before, only now they're going to do it better. No, you're not going to continue at all what you were doing before because you are not the same person you were before. There are new things that open up into the life. A whole new world opens up. You now are on the way to a reality that did not exist before because you are a reality that did not exist before. A new creation, a new creature... Meaning, take that literally. Scripture teaches the new creation is free to experience the joys of life on earth and prepare for the glories of life in eternity. Turn to Romans 8th chapter, verse 1 to 5. This only applies to the person who has been born again and has the spirit operating within their life, has reached the stage of maturity where they put down the sin spirit and they are totally dominated by the Holy Spirit. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Notice it's conditional. There's no condemnation to the person who is dominated by the Spirit in his life. The new creation Spirit. The Holy Spirit which cohabits with our new creation Spirit and is guiding, <coughs> instructing, and directing. That life is totally free from the restrictions, <coughs> the curses, the limitations that everybody else is struggling with, who doesn't know and hasn't applied those principles. <clears throat> and he goes on, For what the law could not do in that it was weak to the flesh, 
God sending His own Son in likeness of sinful flesh, and what sin condemned sin in the flesh. So the Lord Jesus, through His work on the cross, brought about the conditions in which we can walk in the newness of life. He's the one that established the ability of us to experience the new birth through His triumphant work on the cross at Calvary. Then he goes on, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. When he says the flesh, he's talking about the old carnal nature, which is dominated by the sin spirit. It operates even in Christians, if they allow it to. If they do not grow to a point but they're dominated by the new spirit nature, they're going to be dominated by the old carnal nature. And this is what Paul is referring to. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And the Holy Spirit brings a whole new reality into being in our life. You don't look at things the way you looked at them before. You don't experience the same things you experienced before. Everything is changed. God literally makes you a new creation with different attributes than you had before, a different comprehension than you had before, different personality that you had before. Turn to the book of Colossians. You are now designed for life in heaven. Life in not heaven. Before, you were an earth-centered being who couldn't perceive or con conceive of anything beyond planetary existence. In Christ, you're now being designed for a cosmic existence, life beyond this world, a life that transcends the human experience. Colossians, third chapter. I'm going to read starting with verse 1 to 3. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. For Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. You are no longer an earth-centered being. The human race was created for life on earth. Read Genesis, the first chapter. Given dominion over the things of the earth, over the fish of the sea, the flowers, the fauna, all the rest of that. In Christ, that's not mandated. You are now being established to dwell in the very heavens, ultimately in the presence of the Creator Himself. And this life that you have now is a preparation for that. The Holy Spirit is given to us to lead us, guide us, and instruct us in the path in which we will walk preparing ourselves for the glories of the heavens when we leave this world. This is what Paul is writing about. He's saying you can enjoy life to the full here, but you understand <clears throat> that even the things you enjoy in this life are not <clears throat> basically what you're designed to do. You're designed for life and eternity. You're designed for things that have no limitation. You're designed for life in what is called the realms of light. Life here revolves around the realms of matter. Uh, before we became born again, we were basically <clears throat> creatures of Eretz, matter. The new birth experience makes you a creature of light, a light being and transcends you into a state, a reality of light. And this is what Paul is referring to. In verse 3 says, Where you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ is our life, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you appear with him in glory. This is what we're being prepared for. But we have to understand how we operate. And that starts on the inside. We have to look at ourselves as new creations, not a continuation of what we were before. Drop down to verse 10 and 11, same chapter. Verse 10 and 11, we close them with this. 
to put on the new man. It's the new creation. Colossians 3, 10 and 11. To put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You have been created to function the same way the creator functions. As you allow the new talents that are put within you to come forth, you begin to operate in these new talents. You're going to have to fight, though, because the old carnal nature isn't going to relax. relax. The sin spirit is not going to readily roll over and die. It's going to fight tooth and claw to the end. You have to be prepared to do that. The biggest battle we're going to have is within ourselves. But if you're willing to do that, then you'll find yourself overcoming. You will begin to see life radically, radically different. You'll see yourself radically different. You'll have new potential, Absolutely. new ability, new capability Absolutely. you didn't have before. The run the race with blinders on. Yeah. And it goes it's on, in. verse 11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. You lose your earthly identity in Christ as a new creation. You take on the identity of Christ. In other words, the identity of God himself. With the functions. Hey, 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 hey. Welcome, welcome. When in closing, understand you have to see yourself as the scripture portrays you. If you do not see yourself from this perspective, you are not going to be able to experience what God has recreated you to experience. You will experience what you had before. To the glee and the joy of Satan and the sin spirit, you remain in bondage. Same way you were before you entered into the new birth. It's a struggle. It's a battle. But we have promised the victory. And every single day of your life, as you walk the path that God has ordained for you to walk, you will see life in a new perspective in stages and as you progress in these stages you will look at yourself in amazement at the way you now see things and the way you saw things weeks ago months ago years ago you will see a progress radical change and you have to make the decision to do that if you do God guarantees you a victory in every situation, every circumstance. Sharon, would you ask the Lord's blessing or the people? Father God, um, I love you, Lord. Praise yeah. Lord. And I just ask you to forgive me that I don't always act like it. I ask you to forgive me for every speech, sin, and word, or in me. Father God, I just pray for your peace for everyone here. I pray. Holy Spirit, um, I ask that you guide us in every decision. We don't have to do anything on our own. Guide us on how to do that, Lord. Give us a hunger and thirst for your word. We are desperate for you, Lord. Um, this is not our home. It just isn't. Our spirits grow to be with you. We want so much to be with you. Um, I ask that you provide for every need for everyone here. Uh, I ask that you place godly men and women surrounding the people that are here, Lord, so that they can speak life to each other, Lord. Cover the servants, Lord, um, the word, the worship today, Lord. Let it be done spirit and free. And Father God, just thank you for the relationship that we can have with you. Thank you that there is no condemnation. Thank you for your mercy, your grace. Thank you for salvation, Lord. Thank you that you continue to love us, Lord. I just want to thank you for that love, that love that I will never understand, that I will accept. And Father God, let us show each other that love. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 amen.